Young man, cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started this evening, let's uh, bow our heads together and have a few moments of silent prayer to make sure we're ready and prepared spiritually to study God's word. And then I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, in your word, you have declared the end and the beginning, and you have revealed all these things to us that we might have an understanding of where history is going and of how you are going to uh, bring justice into human history when you establish your kingdom. Father, we understand that that kingdom is not today, that we're not in any form of the kingdom today, and the kingdom is yet future. And the only way in which that kingdom, that perfect environment of the future reign of Christ can come into effect is for him to return to the earth. So, Father, gives us a perspective on understanding various and being able to evaluate various uh, utopic movements that surround us today as people seek to solve the problems of mankind apart from you and apart from your word. Father, give us strength as we uh, seek to apply your word in our life that we might be able to stand as uh, genuine lights of truth in a wicked and perverse generation. And Father, we pray as we study your word this evening, you'll help us to understand the things we study and that we can, they will have the necessary impact on shaping our thinking. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Okay, open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, just as a reminder, pull this mat out of the way, as a reminder, we started off in Revelation 13. And in Revelation 13, we're focusing on these two major characters that will appear during the tribulation period, uh, and they will be the leaders of this final form of the kingdom of man. Kingdom of man takes several shapes during history, as we've seen, and these are outlined in Daniel chapter 7. Revelation 13, 1 and 2 points out, that the final form is this beast that comes out of the sea and has ten horns and seven heads, showing that these ten horns, these ten kingdoms, are uh, simultaneous. They are contemporaneous. They are not ten successive kings, but they are ten kings that come together at the end time, forming this uh, final kingdom that is uh, g- governed by the Antichrist. Revelation 13.2 picks up the imagery of the leopard, the bear, and the lion, which comes directly out of uh, Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel has a night vision where he sees the flow of history through these four beasts that appear to him in that dream. The dream that he has, as we've seen, is uh, comparable to the a flow of history that's revealed in Daniel chapter 2, where Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream. That In that dream, he saw a great statue. The statue had a head of gold, chest of silver, uh, waist, tor- torso, lower torso of bronze, and legs of iron, and feet and ankles of iron and clay. The picture of the kingdom of man there is one that is glorious, one that's magnificent. That is the kingdom of man from man's perspective. Then in Daniel 7, we see the same flow of empires, but from a the perspective of God showing the bestial nature of man when man comes under the influence of satanic thought, worldly thought, and the kingdom and man tries to solve man's problems on his own. These uh, four images that are seen, the lion with the eagle's wings represents Babylon. The four, um, or the lopsided bear with the three ribs represents the uh, kingdom of Persia. The four-headed leopard with the four wings and the four heads represents Greece, the kingdom of Greece. And then the final form, the 
beast that's, that, that Daniel can't describe, but John can describe. John describes it as having the elements, of course, of, the, um, of those previous four kingdoms. So they all come together. Something from each of the previous kingdoms will come together and be a part of that final uh, form of the ten-horned beast that represents the final kingdom. Now we saw that that represents Rome. Rome is the empire, the kingdom that arises after Greece, defeats the Greeks, and Rome extends uh, its influence around the Mediterranean, uh, including North Africa, the Levant, where uh, Israel is located, Lebanon, Syria, up to Turkey, across to Greece and the southern part of Europe, as well as Spain, uh, France, Britain, up into that area, the area of um, <clears throat> what would be uh, was Yugoslavia now, Serb, Croatia, uh, the areas there, the areas north of uh, of Greece, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, those areas all formed part of the old Roman Empire, and that empire faded out of existence in the. Uh, fifth century, the western branch at least, after the defeat at Adrianople, and then eventually the eastern branch fell when uh, Byzantium fell in 14, uh, 14, I think it was 1451, I believe. And um, the focus here that we have is in on the fourth beast that <clears throat> arises out of the sea that takes uh, the elements from these previous uh, previous empires. And so we saw last time that there is a direct connection between Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. In Daniel 7, we have the rise of the this tenth beast, has ten horns. Then after those ten horns come together, there is the rise of another little horn that conquers three of the ten, and forms a confederacy. So there are several things we pointed out last time showing the identification of the of the and the comparison between the little horn of Daniel seven and the first beast in Revelation chapter thirteen. Just to review you a little bit, the Dan, the boastful horn, the little horn comes up, Daniel chapter seven, uh, verse eight, and Daniel says when he uh, describes this, while I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. That indicates a violent conquest that, that takes place at this time. So what we noted was that, first of all, there is the an appearance, an organization of these ten kings. Now, that's before the Antichrist comes on the scene. So that means that this is before the beginning of the tribulation. The tribulation, as we'll see, we'll just touch briefly probably next time on Daniel 9. The tribulation this is also known, and probably the most accurate way to, to describe it, is just to call it Daniel's 70th week, that final seven-year period that God uh, uh, demarcated or lined out for Israel. And so the, that period, known also as the time of Jacob's trouble, that 70th week period, a seven-year period, begins when the Antichrist, the prince of the people who is to come, when the Antichrist signs the peace treaty with Israel, enters into that covenant with God's people, Israel, that is what starts that final countdown. Now, so before he rises to that position, these events have already taken place. The rise of the ten-nation confederacy and its establishment, the conquest of three of those kings or kingdoms by the Antichrist, and then he takes uh, his leadership position, takes control, takes charge over that a ten-nation confederacy of the revived Roman Empire. It is after that that he will sign the peace treaty be, with, with Israel because those are the events that bring him into his position of power. So I believe that all of those events take place 
between the rapture, which ends the church age, and the beginning of the tribulation. So there's got to be a period of time there when that transpires. Now, there can also be, it could also indicate that the this this organization that brings together these ten nations in this uh, confederacy of the revived Roman Empire, that there could be precursors to that that are already in place before the rapture occurs. We may or may not be able to identify it. I don't think the ten nation confederacy will be in place before the rapture occurs, but I don't think there's anything in Scripture or nothing has occurred to me that would uh, mean that it could not be in place before uh, the rapture takes place. We will see uh, from first uh, from Second Thessalonians chapter 2 as well as uh, some other passages in Daniel that the Antichrist is not going to rise to power until after the uh, rapture, and so no one in the church age is going to be able to identify him. Somebody might get lucky with a guess here or there maybe, but they won't know it until after the rapture occurs because the Antichrist does not come forward, does not take control, does not take his position until well after after the rapture. Now, I think that certain transition things may start to appear uh, even before the rapture. Now, no prophecy must be fulfilled in order for the rapture to occur. I want to make that really clear, because what I'm going to say after this may confuse you, so I'm going to try not to confuse you. So here's the, the main principle is that the rapture, ever since the ascension of Christ, can occur at any time. That's what we mean when we say the rapture is imminent. There is no sign, there's no prophecy, there's no situation, circumstance, or condition that must occur before the rapture takes place. Otherwise, it wouldn't be imminent, would it? We'd have to be waiting for something else to occur before the rapture could occur. But nothing else will occur related to prophecy in the church age as necessary for the rapture to occur. However, certain things have to be in place at the beginning of, the, of Daniel's 70th week. Certain things have to be ready to go at the beginning of the tribulation. Now, those things can come together in the transition period between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. They can also come into effect prior to the rapture. But those would be things that have to do with fulfillment of prophecy related to Israel and the role of Israel in Daniel's 70th week period. So that means that we're not going to look out at anything today and say, ah, that is a fulfillment of prophecy, because it's not. The next things that truly fulfill prophecy don't come into effect until, I believe, after the rapture, with maybe one exception, uh, which I always sort of cross my fingers behind my back, and that is the chronology related to uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And uh, <clears throat> that has to do with the invasion from, of Israel from the north, an army that is made up of Gomer, Togarma, um, Meshach, Tubal, in an alliance with, which is mostly the area of Turkey, northern Turkey, modern Turkey, Russia, southern Russia, which is former, um, former Soviet republics, which are mostly Islamic states now in alliance with Persia and Libya. This is clearly stated in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, there are uh, three or four different views that dispensationalists take as to just when that, that event occurs. Some think it occurs before uh, the tribulation begins. Some think it occurs very early in the first part of the tribulation. Others believe that it occurs in the early part of the second half of the tribulation as sort of a build-up or precursor to the uh, campaign of Armageddon, which is a view that I have held mostly and have taught before. But uh, as I said, there's I can see the other two positions, and I've heard them argued by very competent, very 
uh, very well uh, educated uh, scholars. Uh, Dr. Walver took a position that it was early in the tribulation period. Uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum takes a view that it could take place um, two or three years before the, the uh, tribulation begins, uh, may even occur before the rapture occurs. Uh, and you, you'll hear this. I mean, if you're familiar with uh, Joel Rosenberg, who is a, a believer who's Jewish background, and uh, has written several uh, fictional books, spy thriller type of things dealing with events in the Middle East. And now he has a very uh, uh, <clears throat> well-written analysis of, uh, I mean, a non-fictional analysis of events in the Middle East. It uh, takes a view that, as well, that this occurs uh, early, maybe even, um, I mean, before the tribulation, maybe even in the church age. And he looks at a lot of things that are happening right now in terms of alliances between uh, Persia, Russia, between um, Iran, Russia, uh, Turkey, things that are happening now that have never happened before in history, which is very, very interesting. But we can't exegete on the basis of current events. Uh, this is a problem that uh, people have always had with prophecy, doing a little newspaper exegesis, whoever the current bad guy in the world is, we tend to uh, see if that might, that person might not be the Antichrist or figure out how they fit into into uh, biblical prophecy. But So we have to be very careful about those things. But the um, time markers, the chronology markers in Ezekiel 38 and 39 in relation to that battle are not as clear as many people would like them to be. So we have these different things that are, can occur before the tribulation begins, maybe even before the rapture occurs, but they don't, they're not signs of the rapture. They are things that have to be put into place for what comes after the rapture, what comes after the beginning of the tribulation. So the best analogy is that of stage setting, and the stage seems to be set more and more as every year goes by so that those events uh, can transpire. We know that before the tribulation can begin, there has to be a return of a certain number of Jews to the land to form some sort of government so that they can enter into a covenant with the Antichrist. So before the tribulation can begin, there has to be a return of Jews uh, to the land. We also know that they, that <clears throat> before you get halfway through the tribulation, there has to be a temple rebuilt. And so something must happen, uh, must uh, happen to the Dome of the Rock. Something has to happen on the Temple Mount in order to make that possible. Now that could happen next week, but the rapture doesn't have to occur for 50 or 100 years or more. But those are the circumstances that when we read the events in the tribulation, we know that certain things have to be uh, true of that time period. And so when we see things shaping up that way today, boy, it looks like uh, the Lord could come at any time. But we have to remember that the Lord could always have come at any time and not to get caught up in the... Um, trends of the day that, oh, it looks so bad, looks so terrible, that uh, maybe we will um, we'll be the raptured generation. And some people uh, succumb to that temptation and make those statements, but that runs in the fa against the whole face of the doctrine of imminency. We don't know. We can't know. So we see this chronology that's developed here in Daniel 7, that there's a rise of a ten-nation confederacy, out of the old Roman Empire, that there will be three of these nations that will be conquered in a violent manner by a, an eleventh horn that comes up, and it is this eleventh horn that is going to uh, dominate that, uh, that ten-nation confederacy. One of the best books written in the last 50 years on biblical prophecy is a book called Things to Come. It was based on a on doctoral dissertation that uh, Dr. Uh, Dwight Pentecost wrote uh, for his doctorate at Dallas Seminary back in the early 50s. And in that work, he wrote, the key to understanding Daniel chapters 7 through 12 is to understand that Daniel is focusing his attention on one great ruler and his kingdom 
which will arise in the end time. So this is all future-oriented. And even when he talks about certain current events, such as the uh, shaggy goat in chapter 8, which is a reference to the events that occurred historically under Antiochus Epiphanes, it is used as a type or a picture of the Antichrist. Same thing will happen in Daniel chapter 11. So, the focus of this is all future. Now, a question comes up sometimes because people try to identify these ten horns historically, that uh, all of this has already been fulfilled. So we ask the question, are the ten horns and little horn past or future? And there are four reasons to take this as future. First of all, no historical form of the Roman Empire existed in a ten king or kingdom format. It never happened. And these are ten contemporaneous kings, as I pointed out. They are at the same time. They are not successive. So this must be looked to a period when there are ten kings or kingdoms, ten nations that come together in a unity. Second, the little horn comes in and uproots three others. Nothing like that has taken place historically. Third, This is followed, this kingdom is followed by the scene of final judgment that is described in Daniel 7, verses 9 through 12. And we are not living after that judgment. I don't care what some of the preterists may say. And then fourth, the final kingdom is totally destroyed and is replaced by Christ's kingdom who is the Son of Man that we'll see in the uh, passage we, passages that we study. So there are actually four stages that we discern of the Roman Empire. In the past stages, the first stage is the United stage, which is the Roman Empire that we looked at historically up until about 476 with the Battle of Adrianople when the Western Empire collapses. Um, there's a two-division stage that occurs uh, earlier than that, uh, the Eastern Empire and the Western Empire with, Constant, uh, with Constantine, Emperor Constantine, in uh, about 315, he moved the kingdom to the uh, capital from Rome to Istanbul or uh, Constantinople. And then the, those historical kingdoms died out or were conquered. And then there's a future stage that is set up, described in Scripture. First, there's a ten-king stage. And then there's the stage when the Antichrist comes in and sets up a world government stage. Now, the picture that we have in Scripture is very clear that there's going to be this global, this global kingdom, or this kingdom that actually rules over the other nations of the earth. It is going to take preeminence over the rest of the world, and it has its base out of the old. Uh, Roman Empire. question that often comes up is, do we see anything like that uh, on the scene today? And yes, we do see something like that on the scene today. I don't know if this is the, uh, this is the final form. I doubt that it is, but it definitely is a precursor of that. So when we ask the question, is this forming up today? We do see something that points towards this, that I believe is a precursor and is pulling together and establishing more and more of the elements that will come into play during the uh, tribulation period as the revived Roman Empire. Now, I want to make this clear two or three times that I'm not saying this is a fulfillment of prophecy, and I'm not saying that this is the final form of the of the kingdom, or this is the Ten Nation Confederacy, but I think that it certainly has a lot of interesting uh, marks uh, related to it, and this is the European Union. The European Union has its foundation, actually, in the Treaty of Rome. Interesting that they signed it in Rome, which occurred in 1957. And this established what was called the European Economic Community. Now, what's interesting is the EU rises. This, the, the motivation for this is to unify Europe for the purpose of trade and economics. 
And that become, then becomes the basis for developing uh, legal policy, legal philosophy, judicial policy. It is all motivated by trade, and it's all motivated by commerce. That's at its very root. What's interesting is that is the exact same thing that Neville Chamberlain believed. You remember him. He was the uh, British prime minister who met with uh, Hitler in Munich in 1938, and uh, signed a peace treaty and said, okay, we're going to have peace in our time. And he, he refused to believe that, and to stand up against the Nazis and to believe that, that uh, Hitler was not going to try to conquer, uh, conquer all of Europe. And so the thinking has been among European elites is to try to bring together some sort of kingdom, some sort of government that can unite the European nations for the purpose uh, of trade. We see the same dynamics at work today to build a global economy, to uh, be concerned primarily with how we're going to establish uh, trade economics uh, among uh, all of the nations. The same kind of thinking was behind the North American Free Trade Agreement, otherwise known as NAFTA. Uh, now, NAFTA, even though it calls itself a free trade agreement, really wasn't a free trade agreement. It just gives lip service to the term free trade, but it had its own forms of regulation, so it wasn't a form of free trade. But it's the same dynamic is to let's pull together the North American sphere of influence, Mexico, the United States, and Canada, into some sort of economic uh, uh, unity for the purpose of, of commerce and for the purpose, uh, uh, purpose of trade. Now, I want you to see the dynamics that develop in this because it's, it's the same kind of thing that we see in other areas of politics. It is not the result of legislated activity where people in, where the Congresses have voted or where the people in these nations have voted. In fact, it follows the kind of the philosophy that was laid down back in the, in the, as early as the 1920s to sort of assume power, take charge, take control over things, pass regulations, build a bureaucracy that runs things, and if people complain, then back off a little bit, but not to make an overt, any overt moves that will gain, uh, gain p power or make it evident that that's what is being done. So it's done through uh, policies. It's done through uh, various uh, uh, maneuvers and bureaucratic maneuvers that, are, that uh, take place. Now, in... Um, on February the 7th, in, in 1992, the Maastricht Treaty uh, was signed, which was a, another key move in the development of the e EU. This is the treaty that was the basis for changing the currency in Europe to one currency. It's hard to have a united, uh, <clears throat> united organization for the purpose of trade and economics if you don't have this, a single, uh, single currency that is common to everyone. So this led to the creation of uh, led to the creation of the euro, which then remember the economics then drives the politics. Once you have the move to a common currency, where you're motivated by trade and money and commerce and breaking down uh, some of the trade barriers between the different nations, then it led to developing a foreign policy. Uh, common military uh, goals, uh, criminal justice system, and judicial cooperation with a a supra jurisdiction, so that the the uh, European Union could then override decisions made by the individual countries, which is a violation of the uh, Fourth Divine Institution, individual nations. And it breaks down uh, national sovereignty. But what, uh, what I'm showing you here is this doesn't happen through overt moves where we're going to go out and we're going to amend our constitution in France or Germany and we're going to um, move into this in one big overt step. It's just a matter of gradualism as these policies get uh, accepted by leaders and people just wake up one day and say, how did we get here? The governments have just imposed these uh, these treaties uh, on us. Um, 
It's the same kind of thing that uh, <clears throat> Bush did when he met in Waco with the uh, president of Mexico and the uh, prime minister of Canada back in 2000, and, I think it was 2004, 2005, when they signed the, signed the treaty for the uh, North American U- Union to implement the Security and Prosperity Partnership of North America, and that was part of this uh, highway that they were going to build from Mexico to Canada cutting right through parts of uh, uh, Texas and going up through uh, Kansas City. In fact, these uh, they were built a super highway for trade, and the first customs depot that where they would stop would be up outside of Kansas City. They would just have this straight shot right into the heart of the nation to a central terminal, and then all of the goods that are brought in from Mexico would then spread out from uh, from outside of, of uh, Kansas City. So this is the idea, and, and the Senate never voted on that treaty. Nobody ever approved it. These are just governmental policies that get signed, put into effect, and everybody looks around and says, what's, what's going on? Now, a lot of, uh, there was a, a tremendous amount of opposition raised by people in Texas, and finally, I mean, the governor was all for this, but finally they had to, they, it was taken to the courts, and a lot of the people between here, out in the area around uh, just uh, west of Houston, out around Brenham, uh, LaGrange, uh, down through there, those people just raised cane about the fact that they, the government basically was going to come in under under uh, eminent domain and just take all of this land in this huge strip all the way up across Texas. And so this has been uh, temporarily... Stopped, but the people who want to do this to build these kinds of global networks are still there, and they're still pushing for it. They're just going to go uh, a slightly different way. Well, with the uh, Maastricht Treaty, you have the development of these three uh, platforms, these three planks in the European Union. Uh, first of all, you have the development of the Union, uh, the European Community, developing a, a unity of customs, uh, in, an internal market. Uh, dynamics, uh, common agriculture policy, uh, economics, and monetary union, which then led to building a common foreign and security policy, which is ultimately has to push to a common military for the protection of the entire EU and a common uh, police. And this leads to cooperation in justice and home affairs. So all of these things come together. Well, with the development of the EU, they developed a flag to symbolize their their unity. Now, I'm I don't, not sure how many are in the EU right now, around 20 or 21, I think. But if you notice, the flag is a circle of 12 stars. Anybody here know where those 12 stars came from? Anybody want to take a guess? It's biblical. The 12 stars that are around the woman's head in Revelation chapter 12. Now, we study that passage, and the 12 stars that surround her head are the 12 tribes of Israel. But, but the EU will not tell you where they get this. And what I'm going to show you is this, ten, this, this strong trend on the EU to use biblical symbols, good and bad, for what they're doing. And they don't know why they're doing it. And they don't give you an explanation for it. These aren't 12 stars because there were 12 original members. There were not 12 original members. started off, I think, with six. And now it's got um, more than, I think it's close to 20. And others trying to get in. So they, don't, they can't tell you why there are these 12 stars, but that's where they get it. If you go to Europe, you will often see many pictures of Mary. And Mary will have 12 stars around her head. And that is because the Roman Catholic interpretation of Revelation chapter 12 is that the woman is Mary, and so she has these 12 stars around her head, but they can't tell you what it's for. So that's where they get this imagery is uh, directly out of of the Bible. And uh, so they've they've established the uh, parliament in uh, Brussels. And what's interesting on the picture in the upper right is the European parliament seats 732 members. And the lower left, you have the translation headquarters uh, for the uh, EU, which this is their building, which was built for the, uh, where they translate everything into nine different, uh, nine different languages. Now, you may sit there and think, well, you know, that just all sounds kind of interesting and somewhat speculative. And uh, it's not, though. I mean, th- what I'm trying to show you is that 
the, the those who are at the core of building the EU, who are picking these symbols and building the buildings, know exactly what they're doing and why they're why they are doing it. The architect of the of the translation building built it to look like the unfinished tower of Babel. They are going to complete the process. They are going to undo, as it were, what God did at Babel in Genesis chapter 11. Now, in this slide, what you have on the left is a poster that was distributed and has been seen by numerous people around Europe. This is not something that somebody found in some back book somewhere. It is a poster. It's got the uh, 12 stars at the top over the unfinished uh, building uh, of the Tower of Babel. And next to it is uh, Bruegel's portrait of the Tower of ba- Babel. Notice the similarity. Now, this the poster on the left is an official EU poster. See, this isn't conjecture. This is just what they're saying. And their slogan down at the bottom is, Europe, many tongues, one voice. They're going to restore the unity of the people. This is the kingdom of man in operation. So we have this merger here of the old into the new. The old Tower of Babel is definitely being merged into the modern uh, view of the EU. There is a connection. There is the same kind of thinking that... Uh, dominates the EU that we will see in the final form of the kingdom, uh, the kingdom of man. And so here, just to remind you, is a slide of the map of the of the Roman Empire. So you have Britain, France, Spain. You have Italy, Switzerland. Uh, the uh, uh, you have the area in of uh, former Yugoslavia, Serbia, Croatia. It doesn't include Germany on here. You have the areas of going down into uh, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Greece. Uh, interestingly enough, Turkey, which is trying to get into the EU, but so far has been kept out of the EU. And then, of course, you have many other nations as well. Now, in this slide is a map showing the current members of the EU, the Eastern European uh, countries that are becoming members of the EU, Poland and the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, uh, these areas, and then others that, like Romania and Bulgaria and Turkey, who want to be part of the EU but are uh, so far not members. So you can see that there's a certain uh, parallel that's taking place here. And one other thing I want to point out is the symbols that are using, used that have been um, chosen by the EU to represent themselves. Uh, just a little scriptural background, Revelation 17, 3, we see a picture of the final form of the kingdom as a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So the biblical symbol for the form of the kingdom of the uh, of the Antichrist is the woman riding the beast. Well, you would think that would be a pretty nasty symbol. Nobody would really want to have that as their symbol, would they? Well, uh, unfortunately, that's not true. You have uh, the woman riding the beast is one of the symbols that the EU has chosen uh, for themselves. And that, the coins below are the two euro coin, and I have one of, like this at home. And this is, uh, in, if you go to Greece, you will find this, and they have the uh, picture on the coin of the uh, woman riding the beast. And you will see the imagery of the woman riding the beast several different ways in different uh, uh, different documents related to the EU. Then we have the Constitution for the EU that was uh, adopted on October 29, 2004, which was signed and accepted on Capitoline Hill in Rome. So once again, Rome is a... Uh, geographical center for activity for the EU. Now, this slide, I'm going to give you the basic chronology of the EU coming together uh, 
out of the old Roman Empire. In 1951, you had the European coal and steel community come together as six nations. That led to the 1957 Treaty of Rome, which was the European Economic Community, same six nations. 1973, four more nations joined. 1981, when Greece joined, that was the 10th member, and all the La Prophecy hounds were really vibrating in the early 80s, if you remember, when that 10th nation joined. Everybody was thinking, ah, oh, this is it. Now we have the, the 10 nations of the uh, revived Roman Empire. But by 1986, Portugal and Spain joined 1991, the end of the Cold War with the fall of the Soviet Union. 92, the Treaty of Maastricht created the uh, Euro. 1995, Austria, Finland, and Sweden join. Uh, 2002, the Euro was adopted. Um, 2004, 10 more nations joined with a new constitution. So it's much larger than 10 nations, but it shows that it has adopted consciously this mentality, the symbolism uh, of the kingdom of man, and it uh, uses these biblical uh, biblical images. Uh, in the book that uh, my friend Tommy Ice and Tim Demme uh, wrote on the tribulation, they s- stated, one would have to be totally ignorant of the developments within the world of our day, not to admit that through the efforts of the European Union, Humpty Dumpty, that is the old Roman Empire, Humpty Dumpty is finally being put back together again. This is occurring like all of the other needed developments of prophecy at just the right time to be uh, in place for the coming tribulation period. Now, I don't think that the EU is the final form of that kingdom, but it is setting the stage in a uh, a very uh, profound way, very... uh, unusual way for the coming together of this European revived Roman Empire. So yes, we live in a time when this can be taking place. These kinds of things are setting the stage. Now once again, I just want to point out that I'm not saying that the the EU is the fulfillment and that this is the Ten Nation Confederacy, but I'm pointing out that we move closer and closer to the end times, we see these ideas, the value system that is portrayed in Scripture for the, for the Antichrist, for the end time kingdom, being portrayed and being adopted consciously and unashamedly by many nations and people. And it's interesting that in some cases, like with the 12 stars, they're not even sure why they adopt this. Why are they, why are they using the woman riding the beast as a symbol for the European Union. May, makes you think that maybe God has a plan. Well, as we go forward with Daniel chapter 7, uh, we have to be reminded that God looks ahead. There are these gaps in prophecy. And this is a chart of... Uh, commonly has been used, been around for many years. Different authors have done different forms of it. It's called the Mountain Peaks of Prophecy, that when the prophets were writing, you see the little prophet down the lower left-hand corner, that when the prophet is looking forward in history, he is only seeing certain key events, uh, the birth of Jesus, the uh, death of Jesus on the cross, the uh, rise of the Antichrist in his a kingdom, the return of Jesus Christ, the establishment of, the, of his kingdom, the ultimate destruction of the earth, and on into the eternal state. The, this is compared to seeing mountaintops. When you go to Colorado and you approach the uh, Rocky Mountains, you can see the peaks of various mountains, but you have no idea how, how much distance there is between the ones you see that appear close and the ones behind them. It could be a few miles. It could be uh, a great distance, but they appear from your perspective to be rather close. And then when you get up uh, into the mountains, you realize that there's 50 or 60 miles in between those uh, those mountains. And that's the idea that in Scripture that there are great uh, gaps between these mountain peaks. So we don't really see anything in prophecy related to the church. The church is down in one of the valleys and is not seen, and the next event in history is going to be the, um, uh, the tribulation 
uh, the tribulation period. And following the tribulation period, there is the judgment on this kingdom. And this is portrayed in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 12, following the rise of the Antichrist kingdom, then there will be a judgment from the Ancient of Days. So if you look at verse 9, we will go through the passage to see what is revealed about this particular, uh, this particular kingdom, or this particular <clears throat> event. Daniel says, I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the, ant- and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. Now, this is a picture of God the Father. I'll show you some other aspects of this in a minute, but this is a picture of God the Father. God the Father is pictured as in, in this particular way, and he takes his seat on the throne, and surrounding him there are these other thrones that are set up. Now, I don't want you to turn there, but you can recall when we studied Revelation chapter 4 and 5, at the beginning of the tribulation period, John has this vision where he is taken to heaven to the throne room of God, and God the Father is sitting on the throne, and in his open right hand there is a scroll, and in front of him there are the four living creatures who look something like seraphim or cherubim, Uh, could be a distinct order of angels, very similar to those two. And there are 24 elders sitting on 24 thrones. And I said those 24 elders are the representatives of the church who are serving in the presence of God at that particular time. And so that fits perfectly with the image that we see here of God the Father sitting on his throne and before him, there are these other thrones. The 20, this would be the 24 elders of the church, but they're not identified in any distinguishing way here in this chapter. But once you get to Revelation 4, it would make sense. Now, in the last part of the verse, in the next verse we read, his throne was ablaze with flame. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing out from him. So there is this imagery of these uh, wheels and fires, which is not unlike the picture that uh, Ezekiel has when he describes his vision of the throne of God. Uh, Remember Psalm 104, 4 says that he makes his his, the winds his messengers, literally the angels. He makes the winds his angels. Uh, flaming fire his minister. So there's this description of the angels before him like fire. Uh, Ezekiel 1.7 describes the cherubs, cherubs there as their legs were straight and their feet were like calves' hooves. Uh, they gleamed like uh, burnished bronze. And so there's this picture of fire. The fire pictures purification and it pictures the uh, righteousness of God. And then verse 10 goes on to say, Myriads upon myriads were standing before the throne. And so there is this huge number of angels who are before the throne of God. Uh, And then it goes on to say in verse 10, The court sat and the books were opened. So see, there's a compression here of several events that are taking place. It's that mountaintop event idea of prophecy, a compression. You see the Ancient of Days, you see the throne set up before him, you see the myriads before him, which would be uh, angels and uh, resurrected saints, and then the books are open. This would be the judgment, I believe, the uh, final, uh, final judgment of man, the great white throne judgment. So all of this is, is, is sort of compressed into this image. Daniel 12.1 says that everyone who's found written in the book will be rescued, will be saved. That is, again, just a summary statement of all of the judgments of God that occur at the end of the uh, tribulation period and at the end of the millennium. Now, the Father is described in these terms. His vesture is like white snow. And that pictures purity. White always pictures purity, pictures the integrity of God's 
of righteousness. Let me... There. That'll bring it in. Uh, His hair is like pure wool. Again, that speaks of purity. It speaks of wisdom. And it has that idea of someone white, that their age, they're ancient. He's called the Ancient of Days. Uh, The throne represents his majesty and his authority, but it is the Father who is the only one who's sitting on a throne. Jesus never sits on a throne in Revelation until he comes back at the second coming. Uh, The throne is ablaze with flames. Its wheels were burning fire and coming, and this is coming out before him. This is a picture of judgment and uh, upon those before him. Psalm 97.3 says, Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries round about. Now there is a similarity in the picture of the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7 and the picture of Jesus Christ in Revelation 1. Now this has to do with the fact that the Ancient of Days is the judge that is portrayed here in Daniel chapter 7. When Jesus appears to John on the Isle of Patmos, and he appears in a similar way, it is because both are focused on judgment. And that's what the uh, imagery uh, depicts. They are both focused on judgment. The white hair, the uh, dress, all of this is related to judgment. I don't know why that one slide won't stay there. Revelation 1, 12, and 13 uh, depicts that. I can't get it to say. There must be a timing issue in there. Revelation 1, 14 to 16 describes it. His head, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. His head and hair were like white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters." And so this is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, his dress, the robe, the white robe that he is wearing is that of a priest and also that of a judge. So the picture here is of his uh, priestly role in judgment, which is what's carried out in the book of Revelation, presenting Jesus Christ as the judge. Then in Daniel 7, verses 11 and 12, we have the picture of the final judgment on the kingdom of man. And Daniel writes, Then I kept looking, because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking, I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. Now that's described in Revelation 19. As for the rest of the beasts, what are the rest of the beasts? That's the other elements from the previous kingdoms, from Uh, Babylon, uh, Persia, and Greece. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away. So their dominion, these elements that have been part of uh, the uh, Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the the Greeks, and the Romans, continues and is all still a part of that revived Roman Empire until it is destroyed, and then the dominion of all is destroyed uh, at the same time. So for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted them for an appointed period of time. That extension of life refers to that extension during the period of the revived Roman Empire. And this is compared to Revelation 19 19, where John writes, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat upon the horse and against his army. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his present, by, uh, in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. Now, this is the same thing that you see that we saw depicted in Daniel chapter uh, chapter 7. And then back in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, we see the conclusion. John said, I mean, Daniel says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. This is the image that gets picked up 
again and again and again in the Gospels. And later, whenever you read the phrase Son of Man, it comes out of Daniel 7. can't come from any place else. It is one like a Son of Man was coming. He came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. This is the same image that we have in Revelation 4, 5 of the Lamb who is found, who is qualified because he was slain for our sins. So he is qualified to go to the Father and to take the scroll and to open the scroll. That's the same picture that we have here. He came up to the Ancient of Days, was presented before him, and to him was given dominion. I want you to notice these two words, dominion and kingdom. To him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. It's not given, the kingdom isn't given to Jesus until that time. So we're not in a mystery form of the kingdom today. We're not in a spiritual form of the kingdom today. We're not in any form of the kingdom today. And no form of the kingdom, no form of utopia can come about today. And the problem is mankind under the kingdom of man has been mesmerized by this idea of creating a perfect society and a perfect utopia on earth. And this this energizes uh, has truly energized political parties and political philosophy since the 19th century, but of course it precedes that. But since the middle of the 19th century, this has been a major player, especially in progressive views of, of politics and progressive views of government, and that affects both liberals and conservatives. And it is the idea that we can bring in, the government can bring in a perfect society that can solve all of the problems of man and can solve all of our health care problems and all of our labor problems and every other problem that we face because the government can do it. But that government can't do it because of sin. It is at its very core, there is a rejection of total depravity and the sinful nature of man. So it isn't until someone can come and rule who himself is perfect without sin, who can solve that problem in terms of human government, and this is the Lord Jesus Christ. And God gives him dominion, glory, and kingdom that all the people, nations, and men of every language might serve him. They're not going to wipe out the language problem by the European Union. Their goal is to develop and rule over other nations. That's part of what that poster was all about, is that the EU would rule and dominate the, the world. But that won't happen. Um, the verse goes on, verse 14, to say, His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now, as I pointed out, the term son of man is a critical term that is used in the New Testament uh, 81 times in the Gospels alone. The only place you can go to find out what it means is Daniel chapter 7. Every time that the term Son of Man is used in the Gospels, it's by the Lord Jesus Christ except one time in John chapter 12, uh, verse 34. Now, why did Jesus use that title of himself? Because he is the one who is going to come, and he's the one who's going to establish the kingdom. See, he it's a somewhat ambiguous term. It Im indicates his humanity, but it also indicates that he's the one who's ultimately going to uh, set up uh, the kingdom. So it is a title for the Messiah, the Son of Man in Daniel 7.13, who comes to rule over the earth. Now, it emphasizes his... Uh, authority, Mark chapter 2, verse 10, Jesus said, But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, and it also emphasizes his glory as seen in passages such as uh, Matthew chapter 26, uh, verses 63 to uh, 65. Now, just as we're wrapping this up before we can move on to some other things, we have this interpretation of the vision that is given to Daniel in the last part of the chapter from verses 15 to 27. The key word that you see in these verses is the word kingdom, which is used 11 times, two times in Daniel 7.14 and nine times in Daniel 7.15 to 27. So the focus is on the replacement of the kingdom of man 
with the only kingdom that will ever solve our problems. Politics are not going to solve problems. You can go in and you can wipe out all of the Democrats in Washington and replace them with all the, your favorite conservatives and Republicans. It's not going to solve the problem. Because the problem isn't a political problem. The problem is a soul problem. And that's the same thing that we're facing with the economic situation today. If you look at this situation, they're throwing money at everything as fast as they possibly can to solve the problem. But the problem isn't a money problem. The problem is an integrity problem. When you look at at the problems that have occurred in many of these uh, corporations, because they have executives who have uh, signed off on false uh, reports of the of the company's financial standings, when you have uh, men at the helm of these countries comp- companies who would rather take a fifty million dollar bonus, even though they know that it will wipe out the company, there's n- what dominates is pure self interest. Pure narcissism. We have our, the narcissism of the baby boomers and the 70s and 80s have given rise to the most self absorbed culture that we can possibly imagine. And nobody cares what impact their decisions have on anybody else as long as I get the money. There is no integrity in politics. There's no integrity in government. There's no integrity in business. And the only solution to this is not money. It is a spiritual life. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's the Word of God. And without that, there will be no solution, no matter how much money you throw at it, no matter what uh, political parties come into effect. We cannot solve these problems on our own. Well, Daniel chapter 7, verses 15 to 27 are going to go on, and they define, describe much of what we've already gone on, uh, gone through in... Um, interpreting the the image. Now, next time what I want to do is come back and look at Daniel 8 briefly and Daniel 9 briefly and then get on into Daniel 11 to see what those chapters teach about the Antichrist so that hopefully within a couple of weeks we can get through Daniel, which says a lot about the Antichrist, and go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and there we can find out a few more things. Once we get all that put together, then we can come to some conclusions about the the attitudes, the mentalities, the strategies, the tactics that characterize the kingdom of man and characterize a human viewpoint approach to government politics and leadership in general. Because it's not just restricted to what's going to happen in the future. What happens in the future is the end result of these trends that have dominated through history. And when we can isolate these trends, these characteristics, then it helps us when we are looking at current events, when we're dealing with uh, policies and procedures that are laid down by companies, corporations that we work for, that you're, you're invested in or whatever, then you can, gives you a greater insight into seeing what is going on uh, in the world around us. The only hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to be Uh, able to see these trends, to see what is going on in the world around us and recognize that everything is part of a greater plan that has been laid out by you from eternity past. Father, we recognize the only hope for this country, the only hope for us is a return to the Word of God. But if it is indeed a time in history when there are other uh, situations, issues at play, then we know that it is for us to trust you and to be a faithful witness to your word, living our spiritual life to the fullest, recognizing that the only source of stability and security is in you and in your word and in our relationship uh, with you. So, Father, we pray you challenge us with these things we've studied. In Christ's name, amen.